Oh, we're live. I'm uh, Eric Stockstead. I'm a reporter here at Science Magazine. Welcome to this week's Science Live. We'll be talking about pollinators and uh, pesticides and bee health in general. Uh, so we have with us today to help answer your questions, Mary Ann Frazier from Pennsylvania State University and Reed Johnson, who is actually doing uh, overtime from a, a conference in Italy. Thank you very much for staying up, uh, staying up with us, Reed. Uh, sure, sure. I thought we would um, start out by maybe Marianne, could you give us just a quick, uh, a quick sense of where are we with with pollinators? What's kind of what do we know about the the, the status of, of of their health in in, in the U.S. Oh, looks like we're. Are you on mute? I think you might be on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I had to rejoin for some reason. Um, I, I did hear what you had to say, though, and I, I would love to give you a little update on sort of where we are with pollinators. And um, we have had a, a decline in pollinators, particularly honeybees, because we are able to monitor them closely over a long period of time. That decline seems to be increasing uh, more as the you know in, in recent years. So in the past six years where we've been monitoring honeybee populations very closely, we've seen uh, declines in the realm of 30% of the honeybee colonies each year over the past six years. And um, that number we thought might even actually be a little bit higher this year based on a lot of the the information that's been coming in from individual beekeepers and particularly after the beekeepers go into almonds for pollination we get some feedback back from that that and um, the losses uh, a lot of the feedback we've been getting has been that there have been pretty high losses the data from the pollinator survey this year's pollinated survey showed that the losses were very similar to what they've been about a third 30 percent of the of the 31 percent I think it was um, this year but we do worry that the colonies themselves are actually, uh, the, even the surviving colonies are potentially weaker than those that have been the survivor colonies uh, in, in the past maybe four or five years. So um, a lot of the colonies that went into almonds for pollination, for instance, um, are graded. And that the grading was, was quite low this year. Instead of colonies having six to eight frames of bees, they've had four to five frames or even less of bees. So um, we are worried about the continued uh, third of the colonies being lost and those that are surviving being being weaker. Um, we also see package bees, the package bee industry that supplies the colonies for lost, to replace losses uh, and to give colony bee co bees to new beekeepers. Uh, that industry is struggling a bit this year. They've had um, itch issues with weather as well as issues with um, uh, maybe mites and diseases. And so the packages have been pushed back and pushed back. Some people haven't gotten their packages that have ordered packages. So uh, overall, we continue to be concerned about the consistent decline and we think the poor health of the bees that are that are out there. Great, thanks. I'm just going to uh, put up here. Uh, this is a, a slide from uh, beeinformed.org. I think this is the the survey effort that you were talking about, right? Yes, That's correct. Right. And what's, um, what's what's impressive to me is we have an acceptable. I don't know if people can see this clearly, but there's an, what's considered an acceptable range of bee loss, which is already something like I think it's it's 15 percent. It's it's quite high, and then and then we see you know these these bigger losses on 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 top of that um, so I mean maybe Reed do you wanna just tell us a little bit about why do we have fifteen percent losses of colonies um, you know considered acceptable or, is, or how can beekeepers uh, handle that what's going on with that with that with these normal losses well I mean bees can die from all sorts of things even under good circumstances um, I mean there's a number of bee diseases that can can take out colonies and there's also uh, old-fashioned starvation some of these these colonies that die every year um, simply starve to death because they don't they don't have enough honey to make it through the winter or they, the honey that they have stored is in the wrong place in the colony and they can never actually um, get to it to consume it and therefore they just starve to death now the thing about all these losses is that it's it's possible for beekeepers to make up for those losses to some extent um, through these packages that 
that Marianne was talking about, or through splitting existing colonies to make new colonies. So um, we're losing this number of colonies, but for the most part, we're making it back up by just splitting and dividing the, the colonies that survive. But if the colonies that survive are weaker, as Marianne was saying, obviously you can't divide them as much and expect to get as many colonies um, back out of those. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. So um, one reason we're doing this this week and, and, and the reason I wrote a story about, uh, about uh, bee health last week is because of policy action on pesticides and growing sort of public perception of concern about that. Uh, and we've got a number of questions on the, on, on the website uh, about that. So I just, um, maybe you could also tell us kind of what, do, what, what does the science say about the impact of, of, of pesticides on these, on these losses? Um, Marianne, do you want to start with that for us? Sure, sure. Um, of course, we have for the past six years since colony collapse disorder was sort of identified, have tried very hard, uh, the research community, to identify what is causing these uh, above normal levels of loss. And uh, it has been very uh, discouraging, very a, a huge struggle to try to understand, to tease apart these different factors. Uh, Varroa mites, no doubt, are, are an important part of this puzzle. Uh, viruses that mites transmit are a part of this puzzle. Um, uh, poor nutrition uh, due to the excessive use of herbicides and loss of uh, a natural landscape uh, that includes, you know, plants that are important for poll pollinators that have nectar and pollen sources or a source of nectar and pollen for, for pollinators. Homeowners that use herbicides on their lawns, for instance, that eliminate dandelions and clover, which are an important source of, of, of feed for, for bees. Pesticides, Reed and I both have been involved, have been engaged in this issue of pesticides, looking at the impacts of pesticides. And there is very good evidence that pesticides are a part, a serious part, an important part of this puzzle. Um, we do not think pesticides alone are causing pollinator decline and colony collapse disorder, but there is very little doubt that they are a part of the, the picture. And we do think that it's a combination of things that are causing uh, this decline. Um, again, pesticides, we, we in our own work have surveyed over 1,300 samples of wax, nectar, pollen, um, bees themselves, flowers, and on average we find six pesticides per pollen sample per colony. We found as many as 32 pesticides in a single pollen sample and as many as 39 in a single wax sample. So the pesticides are there, they're in the hives, the bees are having to deal with these pesticides. There's been a lot of research, a lot of increased research on the impacts of pesticides on bees, sublethal and lethal effects. We have some good evidence of some lethal effects, for instance, this corn planting, uh, neonicotinoids on corn seed at the time of planting has without a doubt caused mortality to honeybee colonies, significant mortality to honeybee colonies that uh, are in line with uh, or exposed to this dust that's results from, from corn planting with neonicotinoids. We have evidence of other kinds of pesticide uh, mortality uh, effects of, of other kinds of pesticides as well. Um, and we have sublethal effects of pesticides and also of the adjuvants or the inert ingredients that are added to pesticides that are supposedly non-biologically active, we can see sublethal effects like impaired immune system, impaired memory and learning, um, impaired uh, ability to, um, to uh, forage appropriately or, or longevity, reduced longevity, uh, increased mortality to brood. So all of these things are sublethal effects. They don't outright kill the colony, but they impair the colony to a point where over time the colony is weakened or is killed over time, a chronic effect of a pesticide, if you will. Yeah. Um, thanks, Marianne. I see a question on the website about asking, um, you know, why, why, uh, why isn't the U.S. government um, restricting the use, especially of neonicotinoids, when the European Union uh, went ahead and is, uh, they're proceeding with that ban. Uh, Reed, do you want to have any th uh, explanation about sort of how, how those decisions are made and what you think 
what you think ought to happen? Well, this is convenient because I am sitting in Europe, um, just two blocks from the the European Food Safety Authority, which was involved in making this decision to um, have a moratorium on on neonicotinoids. It's not an outright ban in Europe. Um, it'll be a two-year moratorium on their use for for many crops that are attractive to bees, but they still will be used in in the EU. Um, and it's 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 not really clear yet exactly what is going to be allowed and disallowed. Um, they're going to do something, but nobody really knows what it is they're going to do yet. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I would hold up the European example because we don't even really know what it is yet. Um, I, I think the the reason that the, the American system has not moved on this is because we've got a, a, a different approach to risk assessment. In Europe, um, they, they use the precautionary principle where if there's any... Um, Unless something is proven safe, um, they they won't accept the risk. Whereas in the in the U.S., we want to see some harm before we we take action. Um, and and it's 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 pretty clear that neonicotinoids have not been proven safe to honeybees. Um, and it will take a lot more research to, to actually do that. Um, but that's not the, the the way we do things um, in in the United States regulatory system. How do the neonicotinoids compare? to um, all the other uh, pesticides out there, either in terms of um, how bees are exposed to them, or do we know whether they are more or less toxic than you know, the pyrethroids or other ones? Um, Marianne, do you have a sense of how these compare with each other? Sure. There's a variety of neonicotinoids. There's about seven or eight of them, and there are three that are highly toxic to honeybees. I think they're more toxic than any of the other pesticides even pyrethroids, which are also toxic, there are a number of pyrethroids that are also toxic to honeybees, but certainly neonicotinoids have a very, very low LD50, meaning that it requires very little to be, this is the measure that we use to assess how toxic uh, pesticides are to anything, mammals, fish, bees. Um, so they're very, they're, there are three of them, clothianidin, imidacloprid, and um, thiomethoxin that are highly toxic to honeybees. Um, there are other pesticides that are also toxic. But the thing about neonicotinoids is they're systemic. So it's a great technology. It's you put a small amount on a seed or in the irrigation water or even on the plant itself and it's translocated. It's sucked up by the tissues in the plant and translocated throughout the, the plant so that whenever a, an insect feeds on that plant, it, it is exposed to the pesticide and dies. Unfortunately, the nectar and the pollen, which are also part of the plant tissue, also can become toxic. They can, they, they can, these neonicotinoids can um, be in the nectar and pollen, which the pollinators collect and then use as food, essentially. So um, the fact that they're so toxic and that, they're air, or that they are systemic are the things that make us so concerned about these, uh, these neonicotinoids. Again, I just want to make it clear that there are there is a variety of them, and not all of them are highly toxic. Some are, are less toxic, and growers, for instance, apple growers, can choose to use some of those that are less toxic. Um, but because they're systemic and because they are toxic, they're, they're of a concern. That being said, in our own survey, it's surprising to us how how little neonicotinoid we find compared to so many other pesticides, particularly organophosphates and pyrethroids. It may be that we're not looking in the right places. It may be that um, this, these materials break down very quickly and we're not seeing, you know, they have their effect and we, we don't pick it up in our survey. Uh, so we, we aren't certain that we're seeing the, we don't feel confident that we're seeing the whole picture when it comes to neonicotinoids. We, we are very concerned, but we are equally concerned about the wide exposure to so many pesticides uh, by pollinators, uh, honeybees as well as the native pollinators, the, the, the solitary pollinators. Great, thanks. I mean, one thing that struck me when I was uh, doing reporting for my story is how widely used the neonicotinoids are, the seed treatments that, that um, I think the figure was 95% of the corn in the U.S. is planted with this, this seed treatment and, and, and more than half of the soybean. And then it's improved on a, approved for use in a huge number of home and garden products. So That's even if you're uh, a suburban bee, you're, it's not like you're, uh, you're free from exposure to this. But I was also struck by it, it seemed like it's quite difficult um, to figure out what does this mean for a whole colony. 
So you can have, you can show in a lab quite clearly that an individual B will suffer neurologically from exposure to it. But it's, uh, but it's a lot harder to, to say, well, this colony or this many colonies um, died out because of neonicotinoids in, in, in particular. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe Reed, do you have a sense about, like, how does the research go from here in terms of figuring out what we need to know uh, in order to make those kinds of really informed regulatory decisions? Well, I, I think that this is the reason that these have not been banned in the U.S. yet, is because it's very difficult to show effects on, on whole colonies. Um, I mean, well, as you said, you can show effects definitely in the, in the lab. Um, that's a real tricky thing. How do you demonstrate effects on the hive? Um, I think it might just take some um, longer-term monitoring of colonies, uh, even though people have done some of that, um, better understanding of how bees are exposed to these these pestis, these neonicotinoids. Um, I think com computer modeling of colony dynamics and the colony population may help us get a better understanding on on um, how this is working in the colony. Now, before I, before I, I go on, I should say that it's it is extremely difficult to do these kind of experiments in full colonies in the field. Because, and this is the real reason that we haven't been able to, to demonstrate an effect. If there's an effect, it's not large, and it's, it's almost impossible to detect, given the variability between honeybee colonies anyway. Um, honeybee colonies are incredibly variable. They forage over a tremendously wide range, up to three miles from the, the colony. So they're exposed to a lot of other things besides what you're treating them with. Um, and that can just confound your experiment and... and and they'll live and die for reasons you don't understand, uh, not, not related to your experiments. So it can be a very tricky thing to do these kind of experiments on whole colonies. Uh, we just got a, a question a little while ago about um, a newly approved insecticide um, that EPA has is, is given the green light to. I think it's sulfoxaflor. <laughs> sulfoxaflor. And the um, uh, commenter had a question about what what's your... Uh, impression of that is how much of a concern does adding another insecticide to the uh, to the mix do. Um, Marianne, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean there's a lot of concern that again here's a pesticide that is known to be highly toxic to pollinators and you know do we have the, the means or the data as well as the means to try to protect pollinators from another yet another toxic pesticide so there's a lot of concern um, in the in the, the pollinator community and I'm talking about beekeepers as well as those who are concerned about food crops the you know the, those who are depending on pollinators native and um, managed pollinators that um, is this a wise choice at this point in time to to register yet another material that is 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 highly toxic to pollinators and um, there, uh, a lot of concern and you know I, I think people need to start making a fuss about the fact that we're maybe not maybe that we should be a little bit more precautionary in our approach to this kind of thing Yeah, Reed, do you want to add, add anything? Well, I mean, it, it, it works through the same mode of action as the neonicotinoids. So it's, um, it's I, I don't know, we don't know much about it. I, I've never worked with it. it. It'll be interesting to see what, um, if it has effects that are worse than the, the neonicotinoids we already know. Um, I mean, I should say that a lot of the insecticides out there are also incredibly toxic to bees. The pyrethroids and the organophosphates are both highly toxic to bees as well. Um, so, I mean, if, if this replaces something that's more toxic to bees, then it's, I guess it's, it's progress. It's, because this, it's not quite as toxic as some of the neonicotinoids, and it's not quite as toxic as some of the pyrethroids. It's still quite toxic, though. Um, yeah. So it'll be, it'll, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Thanks. You know, there's a, a question here from someone uh, calling himself a concerned beekeeper, and and the question is, isn't isn't it true that the 30% loss figure cited is for winter losses? I'm told by commercial beekeepers that actual losses over the course of an entire season uh, is 60% or more. So um, 
sounds like there's there, there there's certainly some variability in range. Um, and I guess how bad is it, Marianne? Yeah, I think that's a good point, is that a lot of the commercial beekeepers are losing bees constantly throughout the season and replacing those those losses. Um, I think there the, the figure is close to five million colonies have been lost over the past six years at a at a value, a replacement value, two hundred dollars a colony. It's close to more than a billion dollars the beekeepers have actually invested of their own money to try to replace these these hives. And so Absolutely, the the figures are that over with the survey, the Bee Informed survey, and the survey that we use, and we wait every spring to to get the data on, is for overwintering losses, not for the losses that are occurring throughout the year. And those can be significant, can be substantial. And so it's absolutely right the, that that figure of thirty percent loss is very conservative. Um, so. And the, and the and the value the, the the money that the beekeepers have had to um, put into these operations to keep these 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 colonies going and to be, in order to meet the pollination need is just huge. And we're as concerned about the bees that we're losing as we are about the beekeepers. A lot of these commercial beekeepers are kind of at the end of their financial and you know emotional ability to deal with this problem. A lot of them are 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 giving up and or going to give up in the near future and there are not a lot of people standing in line to become commercial beekeepers and take the place of these people so um, I think growers need to be very very concerned and consumers those of us who enjoy fruits and vegetables need to be concerned about where are the pollinator pollination units going to come from in order to meet the need uh, for pollination of these fruits and vegetable and nut crops thanks um so there are a bunch of other questions um, on the on the on the web page right now about about uh, other types of stresses that that honeybees face in addition to pesticides. And one was about uh, road stress between traveling. And, and uh, I think one of the, very early on we heard about the almond crop. Do you want to just maybe give people who or may not be familiar a, a sense about what you know, this? Um, migratory beekeeping business is like and what that means for colony health? Well, so almonds bloom out in California in February and there are about 800,000 acres of almonds out there currently that will bloom every February and each acre of almonds needs two colonies of bees to be properly pollinated because almonds require uh, pollination from, from other, variety, other varieties of almonds in order to produce the fruit. So there, if you do the math, that means they need 1.6 million colonies of bees in California in February. There are approximately 2.5 million colonies of bees in the entire United States. And so that means that approximately 1 million colonies of bees need to go to California each February in order to meet this pollination need for almonds. And they get there on, on semi-trucks. Um, so they're, they are hauled across the country. Um, in order to meet this pollination need uh, for almonds. Uh, I get the sense that that is not an easy life for honeybees compared to maybe other ways that, that they may live their lives. Um, that the timing is hard, that nutrition in that kind of uh, work environment for a bee is, is different, um, that there may be disease problems because so many bees are in close proximity. Uh, Marianne, do you want to Talk a little bit about what what might be hard on bees about. Yeah, I mean all those things you just mentioned. Uh, this, there is stress associated with moving bees across the country in semi trucks. When we put them in large holding yards or, or in orchards where they're very in very close proximity to each other, it is like you know a big city where diseases can be spread very very uh, quickly. If if one or two colonies are diseased, those diseases can easily be be uh, transmitted. And um, whenever they're in almonds, be, be, honeybees are, are a kind of bee that needs diverse sources of pollen. They cannot rear their young, their brood, on pollen from one source. They need diverse sources of pollen. This is why they're such good pollinators. They're considered generalists. They pollinate a lot of crops because they're after a lot of different kinds of, of, of pollen. And you can see this very clearly even when they're in apple orchards that are you know very densely populate, populated with apple trees. Um, when we look at the pollen from that, the, the pollen may be 40, 50, maybe 60 percent apple pollen 
or sometimes even much lower than that, and a lot of other kinds of pollen mixed in. And it's again because they need that. Well, of course, when they're in almonds and they only have almond trees to um, collect pollen from, over all over a long term, that's that's I mean, over a short term, that's probably not that harmful to them. They certainly build up. They can build up quite significantly in in almonds. Um, but over the long term, that's probably not a healthy healthy scenario for them. Um, beekeepers do do a lot of things to try to assist these bees in this difficult situation. They feed them pollen substitutes. They do uh, actually also feed them uh, sugar syrup, to, which is a very common practice to get bees to, to build up and be nourished until they're needed for the, 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 the pollination of the crop. But certainly these things, everything that we do to manage honeybees, you know they're at their healthiest probably when they're out in the wild and they're able to over t over time become d resistance to mites and diseases on their own but when we take them out of that wild scenario and start managing them pretty much everything we do is putting some level of stress on them and i think it's becoming a question of how much stress can we expect them to to sustain and we're beyond that point we are putting too much stress on the bees for lots of different reasons and um, we need to back off, and we need to find out what, wh how, can, what can, what are, which of these stresses can we remove, and make it easier for these bees to survive and um, and, and thrive. And, and we're definitely not there. We are. We have pushed the. We have pushed the envelope here. Thanks. Um, we have another question. Of maybe Reed, you could address this. Um, and the comment uh, a little while ago was, I'd like you to address the role that GMOs are playing in the ongoing challenges that our pollinators face. Where does the scientific community stand as far as research in this important issue? And, and then there's a related comment that says, uh, since BT, uh, and uh, since BT is a live bacteria attached to other vectors, why is no one looking at the, pest, at the pesticide as, as another cause of honeybee demise? And BT, of course, is in uh, several GMO crops. Reed, what's what's the is there a scientific consensus on 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 uh, GM crops and pollinators? Well, there there are two kinds of GM crops out there. The, the first kind that you mentioned has this BT toxin in it, which is highly specific for depending on the toxin, and highly specific for either um, caterpillars or beetle larvae, um, which is actually a good thing for honeybees because they're a different kind of insect, and the the BT toxin really does not affect. Honeybees. There have been a whole stack of studies um, trying to find an effect of BT toxin on honeybees, and it just it just does not seem to exist. Um, now, the other kind of GM crop is uh, herbicide resistance, and this definitely has an effect on honeybees because it allows growers to use herbicide to control the weeds throughout their their fields that would otherwise be growing up and flowering and providing a food source for honeybees. Um, during the growing season. So I, I, of the GM crops, I'm much more concerned with the, the herbicide resistance just because it encourages more herbicide use and reduces the number of flowering weeds out there for bees to, to visit. Yeah, interesting. So, so um, there's another, this is a, maybe a, a segue into um, what can be done about, um, about um, bee and pollinator um, health. Here, here's a comment. There's a number of measures have been proposed to prevent bee losses, such as more diverse landscape, more flowering plants, like you just mentioned, better nutrition, control of the varroa mite, uh, bans on pesticides. What can be expected from those measures, and what would be, you know, how would you rank them in terms of their effectiveness? Marianne, you want to start on I'll things? I'll take, I'll take a stab at it and then invite Reed to participate to, to join yeah. it. There's um. You know, yeah, there's a lot of things that need to be done, in my mind. Um, one of the most important things, I think, is that beekeepers are going to actually have to change some of their practices. For instance, we do have this varroa mite. It is, it is a huge problem. It has been for 20 years. We have used pesticides in our beehives to control this mite. And this is part of a problem. This, these pesticides have built up and are contributing to the pesticide load in the hive. Some of these things we just mentioned, cramming bees into apiaries where they, um, or holding yards where they can share diseases, um, is, is a management 
issue. These are things that beekeepers, you know, need to face and need to, to deal with. Uh, we need to change that segment of our. I mean, the, the beekeepers themselves have some things that they need to do and they can do. And one of the biggest things that we, I think, need to, as a research community, need to support beekeepers in is finding alternative measurements for control of varroa mites. And in my mind, this means resistant varieties. We need to work much harder on on, on mite resistant varieties of bees rather than depending on chemical control. I think agricultural practices also have got to change. Large mono, and this is a, this is a huge, going to be a huge uh, beast to tackle, but these large monocultures that get rid of all the, 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 the other flowering plants around that use large amounts of, of pesticides, um, this is not sustainable in the long term not only for the pollinators and beneficial insects that live in these places and that are helpful to the, the crops and to the farmers, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not healthy for our environment and, and humans in the long run. So that has to change. That, that, and I think lastly, the way we regulate these things um, has to also change. Uh, our, our Environmental Protection Agency is, uh, is, is, is falling short of, of protecting the environment environment and in, in the environment I include pollinators and so uh, it's it's not working and I, I mean all I, I can't stress how many people uh, from many many walks of life agree that this system is broken and needs to be to be fixed how we assess uh, pesticides regulate pesticides assess their the impact on on the environment uh, do the risk assessment on these pesticides that that needs to change so you know, there's there's a, a number of different things. In some way, we're all sort of guilty. Homeowners, I'll just throw this out as, as well, are, you know, able to use many of these neonicotinoids at much, much higher levels than can farmers on their shrubbery, in their lawns, and, and they're doing it. You know, you go to the, the some of these big box stores and there's tons and tons of pesticides, insecticides that are toxic to honeybees that are on these shelves and people are buying this stuff up and using it on their, in their, in their home and garden, and so they want to. We want to blame agriculture. We want to blame farmers, and in fact, homeowners in, in a part are, are a part of this problem. And their excessive use of of of, of pesticides, including herbicides, as as Reed just mentioned, they get rid of the flowering plants that uh, pollinators depend on for for food source. So you know, in some small way, we're all a part of this problem, and we all need to make some serious uh, changes. If, if we indeed want to save pollinators, birds, bats, etc. Yeah, let me thank you, Marianne. I'll just, I'll just jump in and say, in, in, uh, I, I uh, approached EPA when I was writing my story and they gave me a long list of, of uh, things that they were doing to um, try and in, in improve their protection of pollinators. There's a, a, a paragraph about that in my story, and there's a link to it on the page if anyone's interested in, in, in seeing what they have to say. Um, Reed, do you want to add anything to to uh, the list of solutions and what might work the best? I, I, I have to agree with Marianne that the controlling the mite is probably the number one thing, and uh, it probably will take a change in beekeeping practice. And mites and the other diseases that it's associated with are, are probably the biggest problem to to, to manage honeybees. I think that the um, I'm just sorry, just break in for a second there because uh, the varroa mite people might not be familiar with that and the nature of the problem. I remember once uh, a scientist told me that uh, to understand the impact of the varroa mite, imagine a um, a tick the size of a rat hanging on your back. Um, so, you know, give us a sense, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll bring up Marianne's picture here. Yeah, but, yeah, I'm trying to bring it up myself, and I'm not having. There, there we go. We um, so, but Reed, tell us a little bit about the impact these mites have on honeybees. So, varroa mites were introduced to the U.S. in the mid 1980s, and they suck the the blood of the bees, um, predominantly the developing bees, like you see there. That's a developing um, bee inside a cell, and that varroa mite has has laid some, uh, or is about to lay some eggs down there, um, and these young mites will just feed. <laughs> on the blood of that developing uh, bee, and of course, feeding on the blood will weaken it. I mean, that's a it is the size of a rat for us, and you can imagine that that rat would consume quite a bit of blood and would weaken you. But it also transmits viruses um, between bees, 
and between different colonies so that you can get spread of, I think there's 18 different B viruses, and, and a number of these have been found to be able to, to be moved around by uh, varroa mites. And those viruses and the mite together can really decimate a bee colony within two or three years. So if a beekeeper takes no action for varroa mites, he's got about two or three years of being a beekeeper before his, his bees are likely to die, unless he's taking some sort of management uh, strategy or he is using some sort of resistant stock that is, um, is resistant to, to mites um, through hygienic behavior or some other means. Yeah, I, saw, I found a video. Unfortunately, I can't um, play it off of this computer, but I'll post a link to it from um, the USDA of, of mites in, um, in a honeybee hive, and it's, it's really something dramatic to look at. Um, but I think the video was of something called hygienic behavior, and, and there's a question on the website about what's being done in terms of breeding bees to deal with these threats. Do you, do you have a sense about um, how much progress is there on, uh, on getting bees to be able to deal with the varroa mite as opposed to just having to rely on the chemicals, the miticides that these creepers spray in? Are you you want to take that? Great. Sure, sure. So, um, the progress is, is it's, it's, it's slow. It's um, interesting, and there are a lot of things that are interfering with the progress, in my, in my opinion, like, for instance, the use of chemicals. In places, in some other places in the world, like, for instance, in South Africa, the mites were introduced, and within seven years, the population was pretty much resistant to, uh, to varroa mites. So uh, they chose not to use chemicals, and their bees may have some other mechanisms that have allowed... Uh, them to develop resistance so quickly. But um, we have pockets of the USDA, certainly the Baton Rouge lab has worked with uh, the introduction of a special uh, bee called a Russian bee that is uh, known to be resistant to these uh, mites and has released this to bee breeders and we're, there's now uh, bee breeding associations uh, that raise Russian queens and sell those queens. Um, there's a um, suppressed, there's a kind of hygienic behavior that's associated with varroa mites. Um, it, uh, it's SMR, suppressed, uh, or suppressed mite, or, or what is it? Uh, varroa sensitive hygiene, sorry, VHS, varroa sensitive hygiene. And those particular bees are bred to uncap and remove the varroa when it's infest infecting the, or infesting the, the brood. Um, there are also a lot of smaller beekeepers who are trying to raise resistant survivor stock. So for instance in the Northeast we have a number of beekeepers who are very good beekeepers. They're not large commercial beekeepers but they're large enough to have enough stock to select from. So they don't treat and they lose their bees. They have for many a long period of time they've lost a large number of bees but those that survive they uh, select and, and breed from and make splits from, for instance, or breed queens from, raise queens from. And then they try to get people within the area to um, purchase or have these same resistant kinds of bees. So over time you build a community, a population of bees that are survivors, and in so being survivors they're resistant to, uh, to, to mites, obviously or they wouldn't survive, as Reed just explained. So um, there are, there, there's increasing effort. But the problem is when we continue to use miticides on a, a large scale to keep our bees alive, and of course commercial beekeepers need to keep their bees alive, they're dependent on them for their income, and so the, pollen, the need for pollination, the growers are dependent on these bees. So they're in a very difficult place. You know, they need to keep these bees alive, so they do use the measures that they have available to them, which are, you know, miticides to, to control the mites, to keep the colonies alive. But in so doing that, we, we have large numbers of colonies out there that are um, the susceptible bees, if you will. They're susceptible to the, their mites. They're not resistant. So we're keeping those genes alive in the, in the population, and it's making it harder to have a um, a huge, the large population of, of 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 American bees that are resistant to mites. So while we're making progress, it, it is slow, and but I think we need to, to do more along those lines. We need to 
makes more. Is the difference there between big operations that can deliver honeybees to farmers for, for pollination services and smaller local beekeepers? Is that the, the, the difference in what you've been talking about, Marianne? So the, those smaller uh, beekeepers that are, but are still like you know I'm talking about maybe in the realm of 500 to 1,000 colonies. Some of them are are big enough to be able to uh, push for this resistance in their own bees. Whereas the commercial beekeepers, the commercial mig migratory beekeepers, particularly that the growers are depending on, are the ones that are pretty much tied right now to these chemicals because they cannot afford to lose. 90% of their bees, which many of these other beekeepers have had happen, and then they've bred from the survivor stock. Where, where, we, where we really would like to see progress made is queen breeders who can do a good job of selecting for and having stock that is truly resistant and can sell these queens to beekeepers who can then requeen their colonies with resistant stock. That that is where we, you know, where we really would like to get, and then have, with very little dependence on chemicals, have this resistance stock be the key to mite resistance to, to the end of the survival of these bees. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. So, um, Reed, the, the talk about miticides, these chemicals that beekeepers use to try and control the varroa mite, reminded me, I think, of some recent research that you did about looking at interactions, and Marianne, you said earlier, how many different kinds of chemicals you find in these hives. So, Reed, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about what does it mean when, when you've got these different kinds of chemicals in there, and, you know, is the sum of the exposure worse than the, uh, the parts? Well, in, in the research I did, it looks like, I mean, there's, well, first off, beekeepers have a number of different compounds available to them, and they have used different miticides over the course of time. Now they put these miticides in and they are very uh, fat soluble and they go into the wax where they exist permanently basically. So you have some miticide in the wax and then the next year the beekeeper will treat with another miticide. So the, the bees are actually being treated simultaneously with several miticides. And I, what I found is that, that you can actually get a synergistic effect between the miticides making uh, the miticide more toxic, leading to what in human terms might be called a, a drug overdose potential. Um, now, some of the fungicides are also capable of synergizing with some of these miticides, and of course, bees are exposed to fungicides um, through the environment because it's it's um, it's acceptable for growers to apply fungicides when when crops are blooming. So, bees may be exposed to large quantities of fungicides. They could bring those fungicides home where those fungicides could interact with the miticides that may be in the hive at the same time. Again, creating a, a potential kind of drug overdose kind of situation where you'll get, get bees dying. Thanks. You know, we just had a question here that says, what is the exact mechanism of resistance against Varroa? So a resistant bee, how are they tackling this, this challenge? Um, Marianne, you're nodding vigorously. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of different mechanisms. In in the bee, the bees that these mites are found on naturally, Apis serrana, it's an Asian, I shouldn't say naturally, but originally we found them, uh, they were identified on Apis serrana, an Asian kind of honeybee. Those bees are very well known for their grooming behavior. So they groom these mites, they groom one another, and they groom these mites off of the, the bees. Um, most likely in, in our, in our, scenario, what we're looking at is bees that can actually identify mites once they're in brood cells and pull these mites out of the cells with, the, and typically they pull it out with the brood, so they can identify the mites once they're in the brood and they're actually attacking the brood. Something, something happens there. There's Once they start feeding on those uh, pupae under the cappings, the, the larval honeybees, the, the bees can detect this and they can uncap those cells and remove that brood and those those mites and get rid of them. So, I mean, those are a couple of mechanisms that we we are um, we, we know of. There are probably others that we don't necessarily know of, but you know, hopefully, with some effort in this direction, we can identify mechanisms and select for uh, select for those 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 characteristics. 
Great, thanks. I've got a question here. I'm just going to read it. Um, um, and um, it says, in the conventional medical community, currently it is becoming a practice to apply desensitizing desensitizing techniques to particular patients to remove their system's auto-response to certain toxins from allergens or medications. Is there any potential to use that kind of approach in bee husbandry and breeding uh, to help them face the toxic challenges? I think that might be, can you, can you help bees um, deal with the toxins, which is separate from you know, reducing the toxin exposure? Um, Reed, do you have any thought on that? Well, this I, I don't think, I mean, bees' immune system is very different from that of ours, so I don't think you could do it. It wouldn't be the, the, exactly the same method, but you can alter the bees' tolerance of different um, toxins depending on the food they eat. And there was just a paper out of um, University of Illinois where they showed that you can increase bees' um, capability for detoxification if you feed them honey rather than sugar syrup. So there's actually compounds in, in honey that will ramp up bees detoxification and their presumably their ability to tolerate um, toxic exposure. So I mean there are man potential manipulations you could do to increase bees uh, tolerance of things. That's interesting especially since um, uh, commercial beekeepers use a lot of, of uh, sugar or corn syrup to, to um, to feed their bees in large numbers, I understand. So that kind of seems like it might connect back to how humans manage large numbers of of, of bees. One thing I'm wondering is whether you, either of you, see a difference in, um, say, organic or smaller scale farms, bee health there versus these these larger farms. Is there a discernible difference in in, in colony health? Um, uh, Marion, you're in Pennsylvania, which I think is a different agricultural landscape than, than Ohio. What what do you see? Well, it's interesting because we have, um, you know, in, in our wide surveying, we've surveyed so many different um, big beekeepers, small beekeepers, commercial, non-commercial. We have had one interesting study um, that we've done in Marin County, California, where we've collected pollen from a group of uh, beekeepers over an entire year and analyzed the pesticide uh, that's been in those hives. We, we actually covered the entire county with the, the bees, in other words, covered the entire county. And we were really surprised at the low level of pesticides that we found in, in uh, that environment. Other people from, from urban type areas, cities for instance, have sent in pollen samples and uh, it's been surprising the low levels of pesticides we found. Yet the mortality of those bees in those areas in many cases is still can, can still be quite high. And this is why you know one of the factors that leads us to believe that it's not just pesticides. Um, the, again, the mites and the diseases, and, and we do think what we're seeing is an increased number and amount of virus in, in bees. So an unhealthy population uh, at, at large. Um, and that's, so, so again, all of these things we think are, are at, at play and maybe in commercial, large commercial operations, which get obviously exposed to a lot more pesticide uh, and have issues with mites. Pesticides might be their major issue and may be the thing that's causing the most mortality in their operations. Whereas uh, beekeepers in, in other areas that are maybe less, have less pesticide exposure, um, their bees may, a lot of these beekeepers are trying not to uh, use pesticides for mite control and maybe it's mites and viruses in those cases that are causing more mortality. So again, you know, it's a complex picture, a very, it's like a huge jigsaw puzzle and different things in different environments um, and for different beekeepers may be at play causing mortality. And um, it's it's part of the reason why it's it's been such a conundrum and so so very difficult. But you know it may be that pest, as far as pesticides are concerned, urban environments might be safer than agricultural environments. It does look that way. Yeah, we had this reminds me of a question that came in a little bit earlier on observation, saying if if pesticides are the main cause, you'd expect to see um, 
a trend in the in the number of of, of losses and and you know instead of the variability that we see is that very, I mean, read is that variability because of we've got all of these different factors that may interact at different times from weather to to uh, disease pressure is that is that why it looks like the pattern is you know about thirty but going up and down. Did we lose you? I think maybe we lost Reed. Oh dear. Oh no. <laughs> maybe he will be able to, to uh, come back and, 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 join, us. and join us. Um Marianne, there's one term that, that uh, I think came up once in the comments and, and people are familiar with it. That's colony collapse disorder. How does that fit into this jigsaw puzzle? Right. So the way I like to think of, you know, there are lots of things that have caused mortality in honeybee colonies over the years that we, some that we know of, like mites and, and, and certain diseases, and some that we, we can't explain. There have been years of, of, of dramatic losses that we haven't, even before colony collapse disorder, that we, that we haven't been able to explain. In my mind, you know, we have this very serious decline of pollinators that includes honeybees and extends to n native bees as well. Colony collapse disorder, in my mind, is the most recent kind of manifestation of this decline. It's something we've been able to put our finger on. It's been a very unusual loss of, 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 of hives based on colonies that the, the criteria is that colonies look very healthy in a very short period of time. The adult bee population leaves that colony and leaves behind brood and 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 resources like pollen and, and nectar, which is very unusual, very, very odd behavior in honeybees. And what's caused that behavior is, is sort of the key to trying to understand this particular thread, if you will, which we call colony collapse disorder, this thread in the overall uh, fabric of colony decline. Uh, yeah, great. So, do, what do you see as the as the trend in that? Thanks. So, uh, welcome back, Reed. Sorry we lost you. Oh hi. Um, so, I was just asking Marianne what the what the what the trend is. Do we know whether that's increasing or decreasing the amount of colony collapse disorder as a as a factor in overall bee losses? So in my, in my opinion and from the survey, I think that colony collapse does seem to have been, um, uh, has, seems to be less of an issue. Decline, mortality, uh, dwindling of bees, uh, overwintering loss still are incredibly important factors that's still going on. Uh, but I think, and Reed, maybe you have maybe something more recent to add here, but I think colony collapse, this migration, this loss of adult bee bees and what seems to be healthy colonies seems to be less of an issue in recent years. Is that, is that your understanding? That's, well, I think in that same survey, the Bee Informed survey that, that Eric put up before, they ask why did you think your colonies died? And I think colony collapse disorder has just moved down the list. Um, and I, it's, it, Maybe it's just run its course, um, but it, hasn't it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So we've got just uh, one or two more comments coming in, and then we will uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, one says here since uh, since this seems and this I think is the uh, is bee losses bee seems to be a really big deal not to the only to the U.S. but to the rest of the world. Should the Government get involved and set up government-funded companies to breed bees instead of allowing private companies uh, to do that. Um, and I think it sort of hints at, at, at pollinators as kind of a food sovereignty, food security issue. Um, so, uh, sorry about the flipping back and forth. Uh, do you want to comment on, on, on your thought about who's, who's doing what in terms of action on this problem? Well, the, the government actually does breed bees. Actually, there's a, a bee lab in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and they imported um, bees from Russia that are naturally resistant to varroa mites. And they've got a whole breeding program down there to, to promote and, and figure out uh, varroa resistance. So it's kind of happening. Um, I mean, most of the breeding in this country happens by private individuals, um, but I think there's a real push to, for them to, to get some of this, this uh, varroa resistance. 
resistant stock. I think there's starting to be a demand from beekeepers for it as well. So, um, yeah, I think the government's already already in that actually. Uh, uh, Marion, any thoughts of yours about what? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's actually been pretty effective in that, uh, as as we as we just mentioned, you know, the government has gone and searched out resistant stock, has isolated uh, these bees for a long period of time to make sure there was no harm done by bringing them in, and then released them to commercial breeders who are breeding and selling resistant stock. And so it, it, in that respect, the USDA labs have, have really done, a, a, and the government has done a good job at making an effort in that direction. I just think we need to put more emphasis and more uh, effort and resources into that kind of, of work. Right. I think, um, I think we'll wrap up now. Do either of you want to add any final thoughts about um, the status of bees, what, uh, what, what science is, uh, role science is playing in that? Do you want to go ahead and then I'll, or I can start? Go ahead, <laughs> yeah. I think that um, one of the things that, one of the positive things that has come from this disaster has been that people are much more aware of the importance of pollinators and a little bit more concerned about their food supply as they should be um, and the role that pollinators play. So people have become amazingly um, cognizant of, of bees and there have been an incredible increase in, num in the number of new beekeepers, a lot of people wanting to help and, and, and um, play a role in saving the pollinators and so that's been really really wonderful that people are so aware and so interested interested enough to want to become beekeepers at the same time I think that this has put a lot of pressure on the people who are trying to raise and increase these particularly package bee producers they are working so hard to meet the need that uh, we we worry again. This is an additional stress on the on the system and on the, on the on the bees themselves. So I'm not sure what the answer is there, other than maybe to have more local breeding programs and local bee um, uh, breeders and, and and producers that can supply bees locally. Because uh, I do worry that this uh, pressure on we're so thrilled about having so many new beekeepers and people are aware of bees and wanting to help, but I am I am concerned about the pressure that it has put on the producers of bees to supply this tremendous, uh, and it is incredible, uh, new uh, uh, void for, or need for, for, for bees, want of bees. Thanks. Um, Reed, any final thoughts that you'd like to add? I, I, I guess I just... Uh really come to appreciate the complexity of the honeybee hive and all the different problems that can go on in there and their interactions and the um, just the the number of things going on in a beehive and the, and the, the things that can go wrong in there are, are just kind of staggering and, and our ability to understand them is, is pretty limited. But I should also say that, that honeybees are not the only pollinators out there. There's this whole world of other bees and flies and other insects and other mammals and birds even that are, are doing pollination and at least for the insects we know almost nothing about almost all of them so they they may be having similar sorts of declines and we we wouldn't even know it because nobody looks at them yeah thanks I'm glad you brought that up I was astonished to learn um, when I was working on the story that there are some 4,000 species of native bees in the US um, as you said, about which we know very little, and and uh, and and uh, it's a big problem. But I thank you both very much for taking time out to to um, talk with me to um, answer some of these questions. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, so thank you both, and everyone out there watching, please tune in next week, um, same time, Thursday, three o'clock. Um, We'll be discussing the new edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, the Bible of Psychiatry, and uh, what's going on with the science of that. So please join us, and thanks again for tuning in.